First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 12 says, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Beseech means to ask urgently. And Paul is asking them to know their pastors, preachers, evangelists, and teachers. He wants them to know them which labor in the word and doctrine among them. He wants them to know those who are over them in the Lord. And when he says know them, he is talking about in the sense of John chapter 10 and verse 4 and 5 refer to. It says, And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. You need to be sure your pastor or teacher isn't a wolf in sheep's clothing. 1 John 4, 1 says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Today, some take this too far and call people heretics and wolves if they disagree with them on any doctrine at all. It gets to a point with a lot of these guys that every other preacher and teacher is a false teacher except for themselves. They will tell you not to read any commentaries or listen to teachers and that you should just read your Bible and that's it. Yet they want you to listen to them and read their commentaries and listen to their audio commentaries and listen to all their teachings. You should read your Bible and believe it and figure out what your Bible says. And then everything a man teaches you should filter it through the book. And watch out for men who only want you to listen to them and listen to their ministry and read only their material. But 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 12, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. This verse teaches us that some men are in a position to be over you in the Lord. The problem is some men want to abuse this and they get lifted up in pride. And many men don't want a pastor because they don't want to sit under another man. But Hebrews thirteen seventeen says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. So the Bible is clear that some are in a position of authority, but the book is the final authority. And if the man goes against the book, then you should go against what's, what the man says. If a man is getting up and saying, don't open your Bibles, just listen and look at me, then maybe you should find someone else to help guide you in your Christian walk. 1 Thessalonians 5.13 says, And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. If a man is studying and reading his Bible constantly, laboring in the word and doctrine, then you should appreciate it and esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Uh, 1 Timothy 5.17 says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. So you should treat them with respect. Don't go crazy on them and break fellowship with them over minor disagreements that you might have with them. You need to learn to deal with disagreements. And 1 Thessalonians 5.13 says, And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Many times people aren't at peace among their brothers in Christ because of silly disagreements. Many times a person doesn't want their leader because they want to be the leader, and it ends up with fights between them and the other Christians. And lately, even more so than ever, it seems like Christians aren't at peace among themselves, but they're at all-out war with each other. They're shooting each other down with words and insults. And Galatians 5.15 warns against biting and devouring one another. All Christians are doing is going around saying, saying things like, you're not saved because you don't believe this, and you're not saved because you don't believe that. They're at all-out war, trying to destroy each other's ministries. You have one preacher against another preacher, and then these two preachers are both against the, this other preacher, and that preacher is against those preachers. It seems as if they are at, as much against other Christians 
as they are against people like Charles Darwin, Richard Dawkins, Bill Maher, or any other atheist? Have you ever listened to a teacher who pretty much implies he is the only one that is saved, only him and his followers that believe exactly like he believes, and if you believe anything different, then you're not saved? And someone like this isn't going to be at peace with others. They're going to be at war with others. And 1 Thessalonians 5.14 says, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. The unruly in this verse is those who refuse to keep any rule. He is like the devil-possessed man in chapter 5. It says no man can tame him. TV and music is designed to make people unruly. I've even heard that the gangster rap genre and music was invented to cause more crime among black people if you look into the character of these rappers before they were famous they weren't even gangsters all their music is just a big fairy tale to corrupt your mind and make your mind more unruly and immoral when you listen to it and country music will make you unruly as well it's not just rap and rock music. If you sit around and listen to country music that talks about fornication and drinking, you end up doing it or at least sympathizing with those who do do it. And if you don't end up doing those things, then you're still being unruly just by listening to things that talk about committing fornication and getting drunk and getting revenge on people. Words are a dangerous thing. You can corrupt others with your words. And that is why the book of James says, in James 3, 8, But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. The Bible also says, Filthy communication corrupts good manners. Uh, if you hang out with people that say certain things that are wrong, and listen to music that says things that are wrong, then that stuff will run up, will come off on you. And many times someone's words are unruly because of filthy lucre's sake. Titus 1.10 says, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. A lot of false teachers and preachers and evangelists are money hungry. They are unruly and vain talkers and deceivers. They trick men with words into giving them money. But 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 says to warn them that are unruly. And Paul set an example to warn others. In Acts 20 and verse 31 it says, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. 1 Corinthians 4, 14 I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons I warn you. And back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it says in verse 14, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. The feeble-minded in the verse are those who could have a mental deficiency. And we are also to support the weak. That could be older people, people that are just weak and can't get out and do things. It says in Romans 15, 1, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. And make sure the person is actually weak that you're going to support. Some lazy men that are like 20-something years old pretend to be weak. And the more support they get, the lazier they will become. A lazy person will get weak through his laziness because the more support you give him, the weaker he becomes. He won't be able to do anything without your support. He wants a ride everywhere when he's capable of getting a job and buying a car or a bike. He wants you to give him food when he's capable of getting a job and buying it for himself. He'll stand out with a sign on the street corner saying, I need food when he's like 20 years old and in better shape than you are can go out and work. And the more you support him, the more you're 
uh, supporting his bad habits and laziness. You're not helping someone that can already help themselves to get food and the things that they need. But First Thessalonians 5.14, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. Being patient toward all men is becoming a huge problem for some Christians. They have no patience or grace toward a brother or toward lost people. They are quick to call them heretics and ridicule them over small, meaningless disagreements. Maybe not all of them are meaningless, but they're very small and you can overlook them. You shouldn't lose your temper so quickly and criticize others and make fun of them. What if God wasn't so patient and long-suffering with us? Many people think they have all the answers and know all the right doctrine, and they believe everyone is, is wrong except them, and if you go against them, then you're not saved. But everyone is wrong on something. The only person who is right on everything is God. So don't get bent out of shape when a man says some things that are wrong and in disagreement with what you believe. He is only a man, and you should pray for him because you also could be deceived yourself. 1 Thessalonians 5.15 says, See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Just because someone does something evil to you doesn't mean you have to do it back. Romans 12, 17 through 21 says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. You can get under the skin of someone even more by being nice to them after they are mean to you. So see that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good. And people usually don't follow anything good. Even on their Instagram, they are following the filthiest things that will cause them to lust and sin more and more. But the verse said, follow that which is good. Next, Paul list, lists out some things. If, if you will add these things to your daily Christian walk, then you will be a lot more pleasing to God. 1 Thessalonians 5.16 says, Rejoice evermore. And, and if you look at 1 Peter 1.8, it says, Whom having not seen you love, in whom though now you see him not yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. If you are rejoicing, then you are feeling and showing great delight. And this is missing from many. A lot of times you get so caught up in work and the world drags you down. But we should rejoice in the fact that we are saved, have the Holy Spirit, have a Bible, and we are going to be raptured out and get a glorified body. Most teachers you watch today have no joy and they aren't rejoicing. They are just angry and mad. Because someone is disagreeing with what they're saying. And when the lost don't see Christians rejoicing, but rather angry and bashing other Christian Christians, it doesn't make them want to be a Christian. It turns them away even more. So, 1 Thessalonians 5.16 says, Rejoice evermore. Don't get so upset when someone disagrees with you. When someone disagrees with you, it helps you because... It makes you study more, and then you learn that doctrine even better than you did the first time you studied it. So rejoice in that. There's something good that comes out of everything. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, Pray without season. Paul definitely set an example to pray for others. If you read his epistles, he is always saying things like, Praying always for you, and cease not to mention you in our prayers. We should pray for those who are sick, those who are in need, those who are not living a Christian life like they should be, and we should pray for the lost people that they'll get saved. If a man is overtaken in a fault, don't look down on him, but pray for him. 
If he is teaching a false doctrine, then pray he gets it straightened out instead of bashing him and trying your best to destroy his ministry. Don't call and email every pastor he is teaching for and tell them not to have him in just because you don't agree with something he said. If he is teaching a false gospel and not the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, then that would be different. Or if he's using a modern version of the Bible, then that would be different. But if he's a King James guy, he's teaching the right gospel, then have some grace with him and be patient towards him. If he's teaching something wrong, then pray about it and maybe God will open his eyes and he'll change his doctrine on some things. And then 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God and Christ Jesus concerning you. People are always trying to find out what the will of God is. And there it is in the verse. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God and Christ Jesus concerning you. And everything give thanks is the will of God. As you can see, Paul did this on a very consistent basis. Ephesians 1.16 says, Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Colossians 1.13 We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 2 We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you. One of the last day signs is that people will be unthankful. If you watch kids and teenagers today, they're unthankful. They don't, they're not thankful for their parents and that their parents go out and work and they have food and clothes. And most Christians aren't thankful that they have a King James Bible and they're allowed to read their King James Bible. Don't fall into that last day's category of people that are unthankful. And 1 Thessalonians 5.19 says, Quench not the Spirit. Quench means to put out or extinguish. You can also grieve the Spirit. But you quench the Spirit when you water stuff down. And for, for example, if a man doesn't preach about the fiery wrath of God in hell, the way the Bible portrays it, then he is quenching the Spirit. It's different from grieving the Spirit where you don't, allow uh, the spirit to lead you in your life but the verse said quench not the spirit and then first thessalonians 5 20 says despise not prophesying don't dis despise the prophesying of those who aren't watering down the messages many times people don't want to hear the truth they don't want to hear the truth of the bible about hell and the great white throne judgment and the terror at the judgment seat of christ and the horror of the time of Jacob's trouble. And the verse says, despise not prophesying. This is referring to preaching. Many despise the preaching of someone who is preaching the truth. In Galatians 4.16, Paul said, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? If a man is preaching the truth from the Bible and you despise it, then you don't despise him, you despise God. 1 Thessalonians 4.8 says, He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man but God who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. They aren't rejecting the messenger but the one who gave the message to the messenger which is God. And First Samuel 8 7 says and the Lord said unto Samuel hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee for they have not rejected thee but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. A lot of times you may feel like people are rejecting you for standing up for God, but they're really not rejecting you, they're rejecting God. And 1 Thessalonians 5.21 says, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. We need to prove all things, we should test everything. If a man gets up and says something, then we should filter it through with the, the Bible to see if it is so. And people are always wanting proof. But they don't know the best way to prove something is through the Bible. Atheists want proof that God is real. And the best proof is the scriptures. But yet they don't believe the scriptures. We should prove all things and hold fast that which is good. If something is good, we should hold on to it and not let it go. 
1 Thessalonians 5.22, abstain from all appearance of evil. People do judge you by how something appears, even though they shouldn't. John 7.24 says, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. The Bible says not to judge by the appearance, but people are still going to do it. Sometimes you can be doing something that may be right, or may not be right or wrong, but it appears wrong. You can be at a restaurant and get a drink that looks like an alcoholic drink and everybody's going to say, well, he's drinking alcohol. You could be going into a store that sells alcohol and you're not buying anything bad there, but people see you coming out of that store and they're thinking, he's a Christian and he's buying beer. There's a lot of things that may appear evil that may not actually be evil. But we should try our best to abstain from all appearance of evil. And 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice how Paul refers to God as the God of peace many times in his epistles. In Romans 15.33 it says, Now the God of peace be with you all. Romans 16, 20, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Philippians 4, 9, Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Hebrews 13, 20, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. So God is a God of peace. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, is referred to as the Prince of Peace. The Antichrist comes in peaceably and makes war. Jesus Christ comes in making war at the second coming so that we can live in peace in the millennium. Jesus Christ is also a God of wrath. And in the time of Jacob's trouble, he opens the seal that takes peace from the earth. And 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is referring to the first part of the second coming, when Jesus comes back to get us. So you see, at the rapture, he comes back to get his saints. And at the second part of the second coming, he comes back with his saints. That's the only way you can make the Bible makes sense when it refers to the second coming and the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4 is also referring to this rapture where he comes back to get us and not when he comes back with us. The ones coming with him in 1 Thessalonians 4 are the souls of the saved dead coming down to get their glorified bodies. A man was pointing out that pre-tribbers are always saying at the rapture he comes back to get us and at the second coming... He comes back with us. And he was mocking that, saying it's just a cute little saying, but isn't biblical. He then points out that, that in 1 Thessalonians 4.14, it talks about saints coming back with Jesus Christ. But what he didn't tell you was that was those souls of the saved dead. Their souls went to heaven when they died, but their bodies went to the grave. And at the rapture, they come back down to meet their bodies that are changed into incorruptible bodies. If you think that the idea that the second coming is in two parts is a foolish idea or stretching things, then read how Jesus appeared to a woman after his resurrection. In John chapter 20, Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene after his resurrection and doesn't let her touch him because he hasn't yet ascended to the Father. If you keep reading... He appears to the disciples and he lets Thomas touch him. So this shows he had already ascended to the Father and came back down again. And this is a great picture of the rapture. Jesus Christ appears to a woman before coming back down again. And at the rapture he appears to a woman, his bride, the bride of Christ. And then later he is coming back down once more. And 1 Thessalonians 5.23 In the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sanctified means set apart. Your soul is sanctified permanently 
when you get saved, but your spirit and body need daily sanctification. Man is a tripart being with a body, soul, and spirit, just like God. He has a body, Jesus Christ, a soul, God the Father, and spirit, the Holy Ghost. At death, your body goes to the grave. Your soul goes to be with the Lord if you're saved. Your soul goes to hell if you're lost, and your spirit goes back to God. And, um, but you sanctified means set apart. You, you, when you get saved, your soul is sanctified permanently, but you need daily sanctification when it comes to your body because your body is still sinful. You still have the sinful flesh, and you need daily spiritual cleansing, praying to God, telling God uh, that you're sorry for the sins you've committed, on a day-to-day -day basis. None of us are perfect and none of us are going to be sinless until we get a glorified body. And 1 Thessalonians 5.24 says, Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. God is faithful and if he says he is going to do something in his word, then he will perform it. The Bible says God cannot lie. And this is different than the promises of men. They can promise you something and they won't do it. But 1 Thessalonians 5.24 says, Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. And throughout the Pauline epistles, it refers to us as called. Se uh, 2 Timothy 1.9 says, Who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling. 2 Thessalonians 2.14, Whereunto he called you by our gospel. 1 Timothy 6.12, Fight the good, of, good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou art also called. First Thessalonians 2.12 That ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you into his kingdom and glory. Colossians 3.15 says we are called in one body. When we get born again, we are put into the body of Christ. If you were to lose your salvation, then Jesus Christ would have to deny part of himself. But faithful is he that calleth you. He isn't going to amputate part of his body to take you out of the body. You're part of him, and he won't deny himself. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. 1 Thessalonians 5.25 says, Brethren, pray for us. Paul wasn't ashamed to ask for prayer, and he wanted prayer about things like in 2 Thessalonians 3, 1, it says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord would have free course and be glorified, even as it is with you. And then in Colossians 4, 3, it says, With all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds. And then in Romans 15, 30 through 31, it says, Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from them that, that do not believe in Judea, and that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints, that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God, and may with you be refreshed. So things Paul wanted prayer for, was that he would be given a door of utterance. He wanted the word of the Lord to have free course. He just wanted more opportunities to preach the gospel and get the mysteries out that God had revealed to him and the words of God. And he wanted people to accept all these things that he was going to tell them. And he wanted people to pray for that. And 1 Thessalonians 5.26 says, Greet all the brethren with an holy kiss. Depending on where you where you live, here, you should probably just give a handshake or a hug. I wouldn't go up to people and kiss them on the cheek or anything like that. In 1 Thessalonians 5.27, I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. The Holy Spirit told Paul that all the holy brethren should read this epistle. I'm sure all of Paul's enemies told their flocks not to read any of Paul's material, because it's just full of heresies. Just like they do today. Men don't want you to read other men's work. They want you to read their work. Someone said one time that Ruckman doesn't even have the right to write a book. Because he's been married more than one time. Another 
Another said that you should stay away from his writings because he is an angry man. And if you want to learn why men believe a certain way, then you should read their other material, other people's material. Don't just stay reading your teacher's material. And if you're unsure about whether a man is a false prophet or not, read his stuff and filter what he says through the Bible. The best way to find out who is right is is to check out all of them. Check out all the teachers. Many times a person will get a teacher that they follow and will only follow that teacher because in their head everyone else is wrong and they won't give anyone else a chance. They've heard a preacher bash all these other guys so much that they think they're all devils. Uh, I listen to and read material from all different preachers and teachers. I listen to and read material by... Peter S. Ruckman, James Knox, David Hoffman, Robert Breaker, Denny Castle, Stephen Anderson, Brian Denlinger, or Denlinger, Phil Kidd, Bevins Welder, Charles Lawson, Phil Kidd, David J. Stewart, J. I've even read J. Vernon McGee, and the list goes on. I don't just follow a certain man and believe everyone else is a heretic. I don't just follow one man. And the men who sit under that man and disregard everyone else. And that is what some men do. They get a man that they follow. And then they will only follow that man. And the men who have sit under that man. And teach everything exactly the way he does. Reading the Bible and believing it makes you a unique individual. It won't make you act like and be a puppet of the man who taught you. I don't have hate or dislike for any man that is trying to do something for God. You have you have most Bible believing dispensationalists who despise men like Stephen Anderson, while you have Anderson's flock who despise Bible believing dispensationalists like Ruckman and Gipp and Breaker and so on. I don't have anything against Anderson or Romero or Jimenez or Tyler Baker or any of those guys. I just don't agree with a lot of their doctrine doctrine. And sure, I believe they have some doctrines of devils, but isn't all false doctrine from the devil? It didn't come from God, so who did false doctrine come from? And are you so confident and proud of yourself that you believe you are right on every single thing? I'm not God, so I know I have to be wrong somewhere. And if I'm wrong on a doctrine, then where did I get that doctrine? Did I get it from God or did I get it from the devil? I don't believe I am some spiritual giant that's invincible and impossible to deceive. Sure, I believe what I'm teaching is right, because if I didn't, I would quit teaching it. People are always saying, you think you're right and everyone else is wrong, but doesn't everybody? If we believed we was wrong on something, then why would we keep teaching something that we knew was wrong? Unless we were insincere and cared more about our reputation and had too much pride to admit we were wrong. But I want to be right, and if I found out I'm teaching something wrong, then I want to adjust my beliefs to fit the Bible. But I bet men were putting out books and documentaries saying, don't read Paul's epistles, because Paul is a false prophet, he's a heretic. They were slandering Paul, saying that he says, let us do evil, that good may come. But Paul wanted this epistle to be read to all the holy brethren, and even now people are still saying Paul shouldn't be in the Bible and don't read his epistles. They're still calling him a false prophet and a heretic even today. But Paul wanted others to read these epistles and not just the Thessalonians. And Paul gives other commands to read throughout his epistles. For instance, in Colossians 4.16, it says, and when, the, and when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Then he gives commands to read in general. In 1, 1 Timothy 4.13, it says, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Uh, a lot of teachers don't have much to teach because they don't do enough of reading. And 1 Thessalonians 5.28 says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Once again, Paul says, uh, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's always mentioning the grace 
of our Lord Jesus Christ because without grace we can do nothing. And without the gospel of the grace of God we can't be saved. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. This is the gospel here in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that's the gospel that you have to believe to be saved. You put your trust in that gospel. You don't quit your sins to be saved. You believe to be saved. You don't... It, you living a good life after salvation isn't what gets you salvation. Your believing got you salvation. So, you're not saved by works. You're saved by grace through faith. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, Romans 4, 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So believe the gospel. The gospel found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. The gospel is this. Christ died. He died for you. He was buried. He rose again the third day. Jesus Christ shed his blood so that we could have the opportunity to be saved and go to heaven and not have to go to hell for our sins. We're all sinners. Romans 3.23 For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. That's why you needed a Savior. And Jesus Christ is that Savior. If you'll accept Him, believing on Him and what He did, then you can be saved and go to heaven. But this has been the end of 1 Thessalonians.